pretty pretty evenly. Um, but it never really had occurred to me to turn to anyone of my friends to talk about this, right? And so it was really interesting because she she is like, you know, really wanting these social relationships to to share this pressure, and when she can't share it, it's it's quite um, it weighs quite heavily on her. Whereas like it never even occurred to me to like talk to someone else, one of my guy friends about it really, right? And my guy friends got together last night over Zoom for a video conference and we watched, you know, the replay of the Raptors Sixers game and we just like drank beers and, and yelled at each other about sports. Like that was, and it was fun, but it was, like <laughs> Aaron was like, oh, did you talk to anyone about, you know, the fact that, you know, we're going to have a baby in two months? And I was like, no, that did not come up. <laughs> Uh, and so I think that's one that I really thought about is, is the, I can't turn to anyone. And, um, when I think about like, uh, I was looking up some stats before this and, um, men are more likely to live alone. Men are more likely to, to suffer from loneliness, loneliness, um, and social isolation, social isolation, um, can, can shorten your life. Like it's, it's a, it's a, it's a very re um, real medical risk. Um, and I think a lot of men during this period of social isolation are going to turn even more inwards and, and are going to, you know, even reach out even less to, to, to the people around them. And I think that one has been really interesting of, um, uh, you know, how do we make sure that, that everyone is connecting and staying social and getting the support they need, but specifically for the men where that doesn't come as naturally, um, uh, you know, what is happening with those men that, that might be facing a lot of a lot of difficulties and a lot of anxieties but aren't sharing that sharing that with other people um, that might be in similar situations and so that was one that, that really sort of popped out to me as as something to to think about yeah I can relate to that I mean um, in this period of time you know there's a lot of uncertainty around all types of businesses and and us being kind of a smaller nonprofit. it's just kind of like you know are we going to make it through this and and then as executive director, putting that weight on my shoulder and that kind of like it's on me mentality and then realizing, you know, I, I have a team that's in this with me and, and you know, we, we can delegate and brainstorm and work through this together. Um, so some of the, that social conditioning is really strong. And on that social isolation piece, if I can just quickly plug, um, you know, Next Gen Men has our community aspect of it as well. And so we've quickly pivoted uh, online and twice a week, we're trying to make space for folks to log in and, and meet other people and, and be able to, to have a conversation with others. So I definitely encourage folks to check that out. Um, so like when you're going through this, this, you know, I can't turn to anyone or that, that mentality of it's on me. Um, how are you in this time focusing on being an equitable partner and an engaged father? I mean, I'm not a father yet, um, but in the time that I've known you, I've always looked up to you and, and how thoughtful and conscientious you are about that. So what's going through your head in these days? <laughs> uh, well, thank you. <laughs> um, I, so I, I think that what's going through, through my mind is a, uh, is probably no different than um, how I would normally think about being an equitable and an engaged partner. Um, and so like here, here's a, 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 a topical example given what I was just talking about. So um, with the COVID pandemic, um, more people are doing home births as opposed to giving birth in hospitals because hospitals are obviously uh, you know, a place where the virus can spread and, and on top of that hospitals are limiting who can um, show up with that woman that's giving birth and so normally you're allowed one person with you if that and for a lot of women that's going to mean choosing between their doula who's like a, a birthing coach who's typically someone they've hired to, to coach them through the birth or or in a heterosexual relationship choosing their husband um, and so, uh, you know, women are, are being forced to make these really tough decisions um, or the alternatives is, is to do a home birth, but then you need to get a midwife and, and we have a midwife. So we're, so we're fortunate, but not everyone has a midwife. They have OBGYNs. So you have to go to the hospital anyway. Um, so I think that like Mia as, as the partner not the one that's giving birth, but someone who's equally as involved in this, um, it's been, it's been my responsibility to make sure that I'm reading up on what these decisions are 
And so like I follow New York Times Parenting, which is a, they have like an Instagram and Twitter account that posts a lot of articles. Um, and they've been an, an invaluable resource. Um, and so I've read up on like, what are the decisions that need to be made around home births and what are the risks and, and what are the trade-offs that, that you're gonna be experiencing with that? Um, I typically attend all the midwife appointments that Aaron goes to, so I'm equally as informed. Um, now with no daycare, I've had to stay home with Elin for, for some of those appointments. So I haven't, there's been a couple that I've, that I've had to miss. Um, but the, the, underlying, the underlying theme is, is that like, um, you can't allow yourself to be the secondary um, uh, caregiver or, or the secondary household manager if you want to be an equitable partner. And the way that you don't become the secondary uh, household manager or secondary caregiver is by taking it upon yourself to learn and to, and to do your own research and to come to the table with your own opinions. Um, and I think that's something that, that probably Erin would tell you that she really values in a partner is that it's not all on her to make the informed decision. Um, and so we, we, we both read up, we, we, we both stay informed, we both attend appointments and, and, and meetings and things like that when it comes to caregiving. Um, we're both involved in, in making grocery lists for, for, for grocery shopping. We're both involved in deciding what meals to make. Um, like last night was a great example. We were making a chicken pot pie. And so Aaron starts, you know, cooking the chicken and I start just, you know, doing the, like the pie prep. Um, well, we're sort of passing Elon in, in, in between us. And then within 10 minutes, we realized we've got this pie put, put together and like, we didn't even talk about it. It just sort of happened because both of us know how to do that. Uh, and so that's, that's one of the, probably the interesting things that I've seen about being an equitable and engaged father is that specifically when a child is on the way, um, just in personal experience, I, I've, I've had like women reach out and be like, Hey, can I talk to you about what books you read and stuff like that? Like I have very few father friends that are doing that. I've had maybe one or two men that have reached out and been like, what did you read in advance? Tell me some books that, that I can, that I can um, read up on. And I think it becomes very easy to default to your partner. And for some people, maybe that's the dynamic they have in their relationship is that their partner owns some things and they own other things. Um, but I think that with, you know, COVID has, has made it really top of mind because we're, we're all at home now. We're all working together. We're all trying to, to balance work and, and life and, and everything together. And so I think it's become really clear now that um, to be equitable means, means taking ownership, like stepping up to the plate, learning, reading, having your own opinions, um, and, uh, and working together with your partner to, to come to you know, optimal, optimal solutions, hopefully. <laughs> nice. It seems like it's just become like such a habit for you and, and like a default thought process to like take that on early on in your relationship. Do you like, was there a conscious adjustment or, or like growing pains in and around that? Incredibly, incredibly. Yes. Yes. Um, to think that this is just something that just happens overnight is like not at all the case. <laughs> and, and, and to think that someone like myself, uh, I would consider myself a very stereotypical man um, if for, for the vast majority of my life. Um, uh, like it's been a very conscious effort to, 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 to move towards that more equitable partnership. And, and it, it, is, it is not easy. It is not easy at all. Um, like Aaron and I get into conflicts all the time over how things should be done and who's doing what and who's doing more and who's doing less. And, um, I'm sure both of us could handle those conflicts more, uh, more gracefully. Um, but, uh, I think the fact of the matter is, is that we communicate about what the load that we're feeling. Um, we try to, to figure out how to, how to rebalance that load. And we, we, we both take ownership and we both have respect for the other person's, uh, point of view. Um, the, the last thing that I want to say on that is, is one thing that, that I think, um, is, is, is very interesting is that is that specifically mothers and fathers, as opposed to men and women, specifically mothers and fathers face very different pressures when it comes to household management and caregiving. The, the mother typically has a lot of expectation placed on them by, by everyone, by themselves, by society, by family members, by friends, by work, that they're going to like, be like the best household manager, be the best caregiver. Whereas men don't tend to have any of those expectations, really. Um, and 
I think for, for men, for me, that's actually like this, this huge degree of freedom to, to do kind of like what I think is right for our kid and what I think is right for our household and not what society thinks is right or, or friends or, or family or whoever think is, think is right. And so like, for instance, when you're sleep training a child, a baby, they have to, some people will use a cry it out method, which means you essentially put them in the crib, you close the door and you walk away and they scream bloody murder for 45 minutes before they fall asleep. For a lot of, I, I would argue for a lot of mothers, that can feel incredibly, um, uh, uh, like there's a lot of guilt associated with that because you shouldn't be letting your child cry. And so th there could be a lot of personal anguish around making that decision. But for someone like me who like, I don't have any expectations around, <laughs> around whether or not I'm letting this happen, right? Because that's just not an expectation of, of a father to manage those things. And so it becomes a lot easier for me socially uh, to, to, to do something like that, th this cry it out method, which like our, our family doctor has recommended cry it out. There's lots of books that recommend cry it out. Like it's, it's seen as a very positive way to sleep train your child. Um, and I think that fathers are in this unique space where um, they're sort of free from judgment in a lot of spaces. And so that lack of judgment means you can, you can make decisions without a lot, without sort of like the personal guilt or the baggage that goes along with that. And so I've leaned into that a lot. I think it's, it's, it's a, um, it helps Aaron. It helps, it helps me. It helps our child. So um, I think it's, it's a unique thing that fathers can bring to the table. Right. Yeah. We, we might get medals for changing a poopy diaper. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I uh, I remember I was at uh, I think I was at a Blue Jays game maybe, and I I took Elon into the into the washroom and changed her diaper and came out and like someone stopped me in the hallway and was like, "Hey, you're a really great dad." And in my mind, I was like, "What? Yeah. <laughs> like, are you serious?" All right. <laughs> what, what mother would ever be told that after coming out of the washroom? Yeah, yeah. It was at it was at the airport actually. We were waiting at a gate or whatever, but I was like, yeah. "The bar is low." Yeah. Um. So, you know, lots of you and your partner are, are at home working right now. Um, and I think that a lot of organizations are dealing with this where, you know, their full time employees are at home, you know, trying to do their best to continue to do that. But they're also full time parents and, and partners and caregivers. And um, in this time, what do you think that workplaces could do better to include and support parents? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question. Um, I think there are, um, there's, there's a bunch of ways we could approach the answer to that question. Um, and so I'll, I'll, I'll start off with a couple of personal examples that I've seen in, in, in workplaces in general. Um, is, so in my inclusion role, we look at inclusion globally. So like looking at all different countries, all different cultures, all different societies, and, and how inclusion plays out. Um, and my observations, I don't think are limited to Deloitte. So I, I wouldn't say this is something that like Deloitte faces this unique thing. I think all organizations would face something similar, but um, in a lot of societies, arguably ours included, women or childcare is seen as, as a woman's job. And we, we would say that's a cultural barrier. And, and, I, and I would say that there, there are, there are cultures um, where that expectation is, is very, very ingrained, and there are cultures where that, that expectation is, 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 is less ingrained, but, 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 but still there. Um, and what I've seen a lot is people tend to, organizations tend to, to, to address this cultural expectation that childcare is a woman's job by making it easier for the woman to continue to be the, 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 the child, <laughs> the caregiver, while also working. And so instituting things like flex work, instituting things like, like, like paid daycare, um, uh, things like that. And the target is always, how do we make it easier for these women to balance these expectations? And I don't think that's solving the problem. I think the, the issue is that childcare is seen as a woman's job. And, and how do you make it not a woman's job? You make it everyone's job. And so um, I think that obviously the first and foremost is that you should have um, uh, uh, workplace flexibility around um, how and when workers get get the job done and so um, there's been countless research studies that show that face time and hours in the office and hours worked do not correlate to to productivity and output 
there's a, there's a, a point of diminishing returns. There's a reason why the typical standard unionized workday has been eight hours a day, it's because when unions were coming to fruition, they experimented with 12 hour workdays, with 10 hour workdays, with eight hour workdays, and they found that eight hour workdays resulted in the highest productivity and the fewest number of mistakes. And so if they asked their people to work for longer than eight hours, the productivity actually decreased because they were fixing all the mistakes that they made. There's some research to show that knowledge workers, so I would argue that a lot of us work in, 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 in knowledge worker type jobs, not you know labor manufacturing jobs. Um, and so for those knowledge workers, there's evidence to show that six hours is actually the most efficient amount of work to do in a day. Uh, and so um, I think there needs to be like a fundamental rethink around, it's not you know, whether or not the person is sitting in their, in their desk chair for you know, eight, 10, 12 hours a day. It's um, you know, wherever they are, they're getting the job done and they're getting the job done in a productive way. And then they, they can fit in things you know, around that. They can, um, uh, someone on my team is actually on the call right now and, and like they know that like once five o'clock hits like I'm 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 shifting into into you know dinner mode and, and that's what I'm focusing on um, and there's also reciprocal you know flexibility for other personal appointments that aren't related to child care or, or whatever like it's it's about managing your life and managing your your work alongside that but the the primary thing is these measures cannot only be focused on helping women uh, you know, better balance their existing childcare responsibilities. That's, that's, not, that's not what our outcome should be. Our outcome should be, how do we make this, how do we make everyone participate in this new system uh, more effectively? And that means having, having leaders um, that show that if there is flexible work, that leaders are engaging in that as well. If there is time off for parental leave, that leaders are also engaging in, in, in that as well. Um, and that it becomes an expectation across the board for everyone, not just one half of the population. Um, because if we're only solving it for one half of the population, we're never going to achieve the, the you know, equality outcomes that we want. Yeah, I often kind of talk about it in the sense of uh, culture lags policy, right? Like a lot of organizations can point to, you know, great policy and they can say, oh, look, it's available to everyone. But, um, you know, you and I were having a conversation in advance of this chat and we were talking about, you know, how some folks are saying that this is a, a bellwether for, you know, um, uh, feminism having like a step step back right but we we were talking about um how this might actually hopefully uh, in more equitable societies further it um do you want to speak a little bit to that point yeah for sure I, I mean um i've used the example of just like looking at my window here during the day i used to see a lot of moms walking kids and a lot of paid caregivers walking kids um and now i see a lot of whole families walking around so like mom dad kids everyone's w walking around together um i've socialized more with um you know at a physically distant uh length i've, I've socialized more with with other fathers in the neighborhood than i than i ever have over the past few weeks because you're going out for a walk and you see other dads around that, that are also home and um i had one dad be like it was i don't know 11 a.m or something like that and he was walking his kid who's in the same class as you and at daycare and he was saying like, I haven't even been online yet today. Like, I'm not getting anything done. And, and like, and I, I think there, there's definitely going to be like a disruption around like, what does a productive workday look like? Um, I think for a lot of specifically men that have, that have been able to sort of out of sight, out of mind, the whole childcare, household management side of life, um, a productive workday looks like sitting down at 8 a.m., working hard all the way through to the end and then coming home and you know, for some people even getting back online after dinner later on in the evening too. Um, and I think that it's a privilege to be able to, to treat work that way. And it's a privilege that a lot of men have um, uh, either consciously or unconsciously experienced for, for quite some time. And now that's being, that's being shaken like so aggressively by this. Toronto just said, um, our mayor just said, it's going to be three more months now, June 30th, until any of the social isolation or non-essential businesses um, uh, ease up. And so there's going to be, it's already been a month. So four months, essentially, of, of a lot of the population working from home, um, specifically men who probably have never worked from home before and being faced really head on with, um, you know, what does it mean to plan ahead to order groceries via some delivery service? What does it mean to 
you know, have to entertain your, your kid throughout the day because they, they need activities to, to keep their mind busy. Um, I think a lot of men are going to be really awoken to that. And uh, to me, that's going to have a, a really, really strong positive impact around how we perceive work and, and how we perceive our roles in that. Because um, it's probably been, like I said, it's probably been out of sight, out of mind for, for, for a lot of men. And uh, um, I'm really excited to see how that changes. Yeah, totally. I mean, like, I don't want to diminish the fact that, like, in inequitable households, this, this, the burden will definitely disproportionately fall on women. But I think in households that are starting to renegotiate these structures and whatnot, like, I think about it from a masculinities perspective, and, you know, those old tropes of, you know, being a protector, or being a provider, right? Like, how do you protect someone from an invisible pandemic threat? right? When the best thing you can do is stay at home. And then yeah. like for providers, like we're seeing unfortunate amounts of layoffs across the board. And yeah. um, in some households, you alluded to this in our pre-conversation, you know, the women are maintaining their employment while the men are unfortunately losing theirs. And that's mm -hmm. a whole shift in, in that family's dynamic, right? Mm -hmm. And so hopefully we can kind of focus on, on that silver lining and that opportunity there as well. Yeah, I, I think the, the the protector breadwinner piece is like yeah, it's getting getting shaken to its core. Uh, uh, a colleague just had a just had a baby last week, um, and so his wife is at home. Obviously, they're they're both at home. All three of them are at home. Um, but he was saying like how fearful he is because he's like I'm going out and doing all these gro all this grocery shopping because she can't go out, and like I'm terrified that I'm bringing back the virus to our house. And so like, you know, like it's. Uh, like, I think there's going to be a lot of fear in that, but uh, even households where, where it is very, you know, unequal and, and, and a lot of the expectation is going to fall onto the women's shoulders, I, I, I would hope that at least, at least it's seen now, at least men are, are like, are understanding whether or not they participate in it. I think at least it's like, oh, this is not invisible to me anymore. Um, I, I'm getting, I'm getting some, some exposure to it. Uh, um, one side note is I heard anecdotally from a friend who, whose wife is a nurse that a lot of the patients they're seeing in, in the in the hospital with, with COVID are are men in their 30s, which like I wouldn't have expected. <laughs> but how many of those men are, are are you know individualistic, headstrong people getting out there and saying this isn't going to hurt me or I can defeat this or or maybe they're the ones taking the risk for the family because they feel like that should be their their their, their job and they they overstep whatever that risk boundary is, or maybe they just got the short end of the stick and they got some bad luck. But um, yeah, I think it's, it's definitely gonna, gonna disrupt a lot of our expectations around, around how we should show up as, as, as men in general, I think. Yeah, I've seen lots of charts that, that there's the disproportionate understanding and even just in terms of taking precautions in and around um, COVID, right? Like we see that men die on average five years earlier than women and a lot of it is due to lack of health seeking behaviors and increased risk taking behaviors, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that risk taking piece especially uh, plays into what you, you were observing there for sure. Yeah, I remember I was talking to uh, a, an older gentleman and uh, we were talking about how, how this is just disproportionately affecting people that are elderly and uh, he would be approaching that, that definition. And I remember his, his immediate gut reaction was, no, I'm healthy as a horse. Like that, like that was, just, and it's like, it doesn't matter, man. <laughs> like like you, could, you could think that all you want, but like it's a virus. It will, it can infect you. Uh, you know, who knows how your body's going to react to it so i think that i would i would assume that that thinking is uh probably more prevalent than we think it is absolutely all right um we've talked for a little bit here i'm just going to drop a quick uh link to a form in the chat here um i'd appreciate whoever's online just taking uh five minutes of your time it's six questions this is our first fireside chat, so I'm really grateful to Eric to step it up to the plate and, and kind of uh, experimenting here. Would love to know if this was valuable for you. Um, so please do click that for, for finishing later and I'll follow up an email. But um, you, know, you all joined because you had hopefully some intention or wanted to learn something from this. So if you have a question in mind, please use the raise hand function and uh, it's a pretty small group so we can unmute and um, have a conversation as well too. I'm just gonna 
I always have to narrate these things because online it's a bit weird and we can just let it sit out there in the ether. Nicholas, I see your comment around great attitudes and insights. Is there anything you want to um, uh, weigh in with? I can uh, unmute you here. Oh, hey, hey, guys. Thanks for um, taking the time to do this today. Uh, Eric, we, we actually played hockey together about a year ago, that men's league team. So it's nice to see you again. I was pretty shocked <laughs> when I saw your name on that email. And um, yeah, it's amazing work that you guys are doing. Um, no, I'm kind of just letting all the insights that you guys shared sink in at the moment. I don't have any questions off the top of my head. Um, spend a lot of time thinking about the impact it's going to have on the economy and society in general, especially when you've got such a large baby boomer generation um, approaching that retirement phase and what that means for us. I think I'll spend some more time thinking about the role, sort of the modernizing of the workplace, like you had mentioned. Uh, that's probably the biggest uh, thing that I'm trying to focus on, I guess. Awesome. I appreciate that. Are you uh, currently a parent? No, no, I'm actually not a parent. I'm not even in a relationship currently, but I mean, <laughs> I'm sure that'll happen eventually. Uh, I think more, I just wanted to get an insight of just what it means to be an equitable man in general, um, regardless of whether that's in the workplace or uh, at home. Awesome. I love that. Thanks for joining. That's great. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, I'm just going to unmute everyone because it's a small group. And if anyone has anything that they want to add to the discussion, um, please do weigh in. Everyone's so quiet. I'm going to start picking on people. Robert, do you want to add anything? All right, maybe we were on in the background for some people. <laughs> All right, um, Eric, is there anything else you want to add to our discussion today? Uh, no, I, I think uh, I think we we talked about um, most of the things that were on my mind. I, I think we've been presented with a, a really unique opportunity when it comes to uh, this COVID pandemic and, and how we want to use this as an opportunity to, to rethink how, how, how we engage with work, how we engage with, with each other, how, how we engage at home. And um, one thing that, that I, I like to say in all these types of, you know, chats or, or whatever you want to call them, is that um, when it comes to gender equality, like to me, men are like, they are the primary change agents. Um, uh, the women in our lives have have made drastic steps in in, in the positive direction. They, they've they've torn down a lot of barriers that that they rightfully have, have identified as unjust and, and discriminatory. Um, and now the time is for for us men to to turn to them and start to learn from their leadership. Um, I think uh, there's like the trope of like you know a man is sort of unfinished until he meets his female partner and gets sort of sculpted into you know a, a better version of himself and I think that, that we can you know men like to criticize that and women like to joke about that but like it's incredibly true and I think that the reason for that is that um, uh, a lot of men are, are brought up with it with sort of like an innate fear of femininity um, sometimes the definition of masculinity is is is, is being not feminine um, and so there's research to show that as early as, you know, five or six years old, um, boys will start to identify as boys by identifying as not being girls. Um, and then girls are sort of left with everything else. <laughs> uh, and um, that, I think that, 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 that per, that's pervasive all the way, all the way through our lives is that we, we identify as being a man as, as, as rejecting anything that, that reeks of femininity. And, uh, I think that like that is the primary thing that we need to to rethink is that there is a whole world of uh, emotional, social, um, positive, uh, just uh, incredible empowerment and 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 bonding that uh, femininity can bring into our lives, and and I think we need to embrace that. And so. Um, I've always viewed Aaron as, as sort of like my mentor on a lot of these, on a lot of these things and, and how to view social situations, how to view relationships, how to view doing your part um, comes from, from her example. And so um, uh, when it comes to, you know, more gender inclusive 
future. Um, it's men that, that need to make that change. It's not, it's not women, I don't think. Um, and the, the tough part is that I feel like in the workplace a lot, we, we approach it the opposite way of how do we fit women into this structure of, of the workplace? And maybe it's actually, how do we make the workplace more like what women would thrive in? Um, because then we would all thrive much better. Uh, that tends to be the, the underlying sentiment in, in a lot of femininity is it's much more social, it's much more collaborative, it's much, much more inclusive. Uh, and, and everyone should want that. There's no reason why, why, why you shouldn't want that. Um, the pandemic has made that in, 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 uh, incredibly clear that we're all in this together. This is a community. It's not, it's not a bunch of individuals trying to look out for themselves. Like that's not going to work. Right. And so um, I'm excited to see what comes out of this. And, and I would hope that, um, you know, that we as men sort of make that, that, that big step forward because it's, I think it's our turn. I love that reframe. I often think about it if we could do for gender equity what accessibility has done for the disability movement, we'd be winning, right? Because yeah. by reframing it as not disability, but rather accessibility, it's not the individual that doesn't fit the place, it's the place that doesn't fit the individual, right? And with that reframe, if we make everything more accessible and equitable in that sense, we all thrive. And I think from the gender equity perspective, us as men, we very clearly understand what it is we might lose, but we don't understand or we devalue what it is we might gain, whether that be you know, our mental health, our relationships, um, you know, being able to be an engaged father. Um, there's so much in it for us. And you know, over the last 70 plus years, we've had a brilliant conversation about women's roles and identities in society. And we've been missing that conversation for, with, and about men. And uh, I think that's a really great place to wrap up for today. Uh, really grateful, Eric, for, for your time and insight for you coming on here, as well as anyone who tuned in. Um, please do keep in touch with equity leaders. Um, we're going to be trying to add value in this new digital world that we all live in. Um, you can find us on LinkedIn as well as on Twitter. Um, and then I just want to circle back earlier on in the conversation I plugged that Next Gen Men through our community initiative has created this um, next Gen Men Circle of Care, where we're trying to create spaces for conversations men don't traditionally have, tackling some of the social isolation that we're all feeling today. So please do check out Next Gen Men on all the social media and you'll see the details there. And then just plugging one more time, the feedback survey that's in the chat. If you could give us uh, five minutes of your time to answer six questions, we'd much appreciate it so that we can uh, keep having these conversations and provide value to you. Um, Eric, thank you so much. Um, and we'll see you all uh, in the real world. Cheers. Yeah, thanks a lot, Jake. Thanks, everyone. Bye.